last thing we want to talk about is what's known as the delta notation, which is basically just a shorthand notation because us physicists are pretty lazy about writing out things, as you've kind of noticed, when we write out partial derivatives and things like that. We usually don't want to write out the entire thing. <coughs> So we, we came up with this new thing called the variation. It doesn't have a particular meaning to it. We'll talk about what the meaning actually means, uh, but let's let's talk about it. So again, as we've seen, we can rewrite our partial derivative of our function. Again, is equal to the integral from x1 to x2, and then the partial of f, uh, partial y minus d dx, and then partial f, <coughs> partial y prime, all then, times eta times dx. <laughs> now from here, we're simply going to multiply both sides by d alpha. So let me put a d alpha here. And let me put also, let me move this over just a little bit. So I'm going to write a d alpha dx. Okay. So this time we're going to write as simply delta j, which is what we call the variation in the integral. So this thing stands for the variation. And then this is going to be equal to, then, the integral from x1 to x2 of, again, partial of f partial y minus, then, d dx, uh, partial f partial y prime times the variation in the path y times dx. So this is the variation of the functional. Well, this is, then, the variation of the path. And we'll talk about what that actually means in just a second. <clears throat> so uh, here, we're just using the fact that that's what? Again, the variation in the functional is the same thing as the partial derivative of the uh, functional with respect to alpha times then d alpha. And then the variation in the path is then the same thing as uh, the partial of y with respect to alpha times then d alpha, where again, eta, again, is equal to the partial of y with respect to alpha, right? So this is eta by its definition. So basically, the extremization then of the functional integral comes from the fact that this thing now has to just be equal to zero. So now we need that the variation must be equal to zero, which is then going to be the same thing as the variation of the integral from x1 to x2 of f of y, y prime x, which is the same thing as the integral from x1, sorry, not my dx, uh, x2, the variation of the function itself depends on y, y prime x dx. So <clears throat> basically we brought the variation on the inside because basically the variation doesn't change the integral and only changes what happens on the inside of the integral because again the integral has to be fixed at those two endpoints. So it doesn't change what happens on the boundary, it just changes what happens in between. So let's talk about how this variation works because uh, again we know we have to get exactly the same result but let's talk about it anyways. So again let's look at the variation of the integral. So this is the integral from x1 to x2. Uh, dx, so this is going to be equal to the partial of f with respect to y times then the variation of y uh, plus the partial of f with respect to y prime times the variation of y prime. Now, <clears throat> what does variation of y prime mean? So we have the variation of the derivative of y with respect to x. But we can rewrite this then as the derivative of then the variation of y. So basically here we're just saying that the variation of the derivative is the same thing as the derivative of the variation. So using this, we can now put that back into this expression. So this becomes the integral from x1 to x2, and then dx, and then partial of f partial y times the variation plus the partial of f with respect to y prime times the derivative then of the variation. Now, as we talked about before, from here, since the variation must be arbitrary, 
Okay. So the same thing as before. We then want to make sure we can have this whole thing multiplied by the variation. Again, the way we're going to do that is to transfer this derivative to him by simply using integration by parts. And again, this thing has to be zero on the boundary term, which means that the first term of integration by parts, again, is going to give us simply zero. So this is going to be the same thing then as x1 to x2 uh, dx, and we get the partial of f with respect to y minus the derivative of then the partial of f with respect to y prime, all then times the variation of the path. Now again, for this thing to be equal to zero, because again our condition is that what, whatever's going to extremize this will cause the variation to go to zero, means that again, since this is an arbitrary variation, then in this case, <clears throat> what has to be inside of the integrand, again, must be equal to zero, which means that this thing is equal to zero, which again gives us our Euler equation. So same thing as we had before. So what is the variation of the path? So and all this means is, so let's think about this. So here, say this is x, this is y, this is my initial point. Again, let's call that x1, y1. Then we're going to integrate out to this point. Let's call that x2, y2, along some particular path. So this is my path, y of x. Okay. So what is the variation? So the variation is then a displacement which occurs. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking this path and I'm displacing it by an amount of delta x, or I'm sorry, delta y, but this is what's called a virtual displacement, not a real displacement, because the time interval at which this displacement occurs is zero. So basically meaning that I'm simply taking the path and I'm varying the path, I'm doing a displacement here, but the amount of time at which I'm doing it over dt is simply equal to zero. So this is what's called virtual work or a virtual displacement. So we're taking the particle along a different path using a virtual work because it doesn't happen over a time frame, it only happens at the same time. So here, the variation of the path basically means that we're taking this path and we're varying it by a differential amount, or in this case, the variation of the path, uh, delta y. But again, we're doing it at exactly the same amount of time. So it takes no time to go from the one to the other one, we're just kind of varying the path. Now, one thing to note is that the variation of the path doesn't have to be a real path, so this doesn't have to be a path at which the particle itself is actually going to go over, it's just a variation in the path, so it doesn't have to have to be a real path. But typically this is what we call virtual work. So the Euler equations also come from doing virtual work, so we're virtually going to move this path Again, not over some sort of time frame that happens at exactly the same time, but we're varying that path by a differential amount. And then we're seeing how the, that varies then the integral at which we're interested in, in this case our functional integral, uh, to see then the variation in the path. But again, what has to be true is that even though I'm varying my path, the function has to be the same at exactly the same at the, the boundary points, which means that it has to vanish at the boundary points. So. In this case, whatever extremizes then our function will find the path which then extremizes either gives us the shortest or the minimum value or the maximum value. So again, this is what we call delta notation. Uh, mostly bringing this up because a lot of textbooks and other places you're going to see derive everything in terms of this variation. But again, uh, the variation is exactly the same thing that we've been doing. It's just done in a slightly modified way. So instead of parameterizing our uh, path in terms of this alpha and then taking the derivative of alpha and then uh, setting that equal to zero. Again, in spirit it's the same because again we're just defining this new variation uh, delta j again as the partial derivative of j with respect to alpha times that the alpha. So again in method it's the same but again it has a slightly different physical meaning meaning that again we're doing now virtual work as opposed to just reparameterizing the path. But as we can see, the end result is exactly the same. So we get the Euler equation, and even if this thing had uh, constraints to it, again, we would get exactly the same answer at the end of the day using those constraints. So everything that we just wrote down 
<clears throat> now, these constraints, as we'll talk about in the next chapter, so now we have the foundation to be able to move into the next chapter, which is now Lagrangian mechanics. So those constraints will give us what we call generalized forces or generalized torques. Uh, so those constraints actually have a physical meaning to them, and we'll talk about those as we see those in that particular chapter. But again, we have to talk about all this stuff first, so that way we know exactly what we're talking about when we get into the Grange mechanics, instead of kind of doing these two things simultaneously. So, so now you can take some time to wrap your head around all of this uh, Euler equations, as well as this variational methods. Uh, again, what we call calculus of variations. And now we can move into Lagrangian mechanics, which uses all this, but again, uses it in a physical context. So here, we weren't specifically looking at mechanics, we were just looking at some sort of intervals. Now again, <clears throat> the reason we're doing all this, as we're gonna talk about, is because everything we've done here is simply a scalar value, and it doesn't matter, and it doesn't depend on the fact that this thing has directions or anything like that, because it's a scalar. So scalars have, by definition, no directional properties to them, hence there is no vector formulation for these. So we don't have to worry about those things. <clears throat> So, this will be our starting points in the next uh, section. We'll start off with what's known as Hamilton's Principle, and then from there we'll build uh, Lagrangian mechanics from uh, Hamilton's Principle. <clears throat>